So we are recording. Um, oh, here comes somebody else. And people are still streaming in. So I'm just going to give them time to come join. Okay. All right, so we're up to 33 participants, um, 34. I'd like to thank you all for being here, joining us on the Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020 school board workshop via Zoom. It's 6.30 at night. The topic of conversation for tonight is diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Cape Elizabeth schools. Um, sorry, people keep coming in. So before we begin, I just wanted to share something I wrote beforehand that what I've learned since the brutal killing of George Floyd is that white privilege is real. Simply because of the color of our skin, white people are born into privilege and advantage. For example, I have a 17 year old, almost 18 year old son and I don't have the same worries as a black woman. I don't worry when he goes out that he won't come home because he's put his hand in his pocket. But what I've also learned is that although white people, myself included, may think we are not racist, this is not enough. It's not good enough. Silence, standing by while white systems remain in place and not fighting for change can somehow be a part of not being racist and living a not racist life. But again, this is not enough. We need the next level. We need to be anti-racist and truly stand for equality by breaking our silence and allowing, working towards, and creating real change. Black lives matter is important because until Black people, Muslims, Hispanics, and other minorities are truly given the same opportunities, all lives can't matter. We have an opportunity here in Cape Elizabeth to make real change to educate teachers and staff more about anti-racism and what it truly means. We have an opportunity to move forward with curriculum and education that highlights black people and their history. We can shine the light on an in, we can shine the light on equality for all by being conscious to the ways we can improve and educate our students. We are an excellent district. And we are doing some of the work, no doubt. And there's always room to improve. I am proud of our students and proud of our teachers, our administrators. And I'm proud of Cape Elizabeth. I really look forward to tonight's meeting, hearing the ways that we already address inequality in our district. And I'm excited to hear from the forward thinking teachers and staff who have been a part of Racial Equality Institute training. We will move forward together, as Superintendent Wolfram has said many times, with arrows pointing in the same direction. And those arrows will point towards equality for all as we do this together. So again, thank you so much for being here, Donna. So our goal tonight really is to gain a better understanding of where the district is regarding efforts to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in Cape Elizabeth schools in order to develop a plan to move forward with this vision. Now, as teachers, we're taught to assess where our students are and then make a plan to move them forward, each one from, from where they are. So as a district, it's important that we take this time to reflect on on what we have done and um, knowing that we have a lot to learn, we have a lot of work to do, um, start to develop a plan to, make, to, to move forward. 
So tonight we're going to be hearing, as Heather said, from, um, from several people in the district. Um, and I hope that others um, will join in. There'll be an opportunity for others to join in. Um, so Kathy Stankard, our Director of Teaching and Learn, is, is going to um, talk a little bit about uh, curriculum and professional development um, that we're looking at. Uh, Jason Mandridis and Brie Gallagher are going to talk about uh, their experience with uh, Racial Equity Institute training. Um, there's a uh, GSCA Leadership Academy participants are here tonight and they're going to talk about um, a project they did and then um, how their thoughts, I think this is what they're going to talk about, how their thoughts have changed a bit about, about moving forward and, and taking that knowledge and, and moving forward in the district. Um, and then we will have a discussion about, about moving forward. Uh, where do we go from here? And I know that um, town council met last night and uh, they're very interested in uh, forming a committee uh, with, um, with the uh, staff or uh, school board members um, to talk about moving forward in, in Cape Elizabeth. Um, so I'll turn it back to you, Heather. Okay, um, Kathy, would you like to start and talk to us about the curriculum and professional development? Sure, absolutely. Good evening, Thank everyone. You. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to start um, just by acknowledging that I am approaching this discussion with, um, with a sense of humility that, um, that while my intention tonight is to provide a brief account of where we are in terms of our curriculum and um, professional development and to make some suggestions for moving forward that I, um, I don't in any way pretend to um, have all the answers and, and can't even speak as well about some of our curricular and professional development initiatives as some of the people who've actually engaged in that work. Um, having said that, I'm, um, I'm really excited to be part of the beginning of this conversation. And, uh, and then I hope our district is going to have it for, <clears throat> excuse me, some time to come. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I think I have the ability to do that. Uh, we, we might have to, oh, I think. I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. okay. All right. Then minimize here. Okay. So you can all see that, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I've now lost the ability to um, see anyone. So if there are questions um, as we go, um, perhaps Heather, you could just interrupt me. Yeah, I can try. I only see about five of us. I see myself, Donna, you, Del, Jason, and Phil. So oh, okay. uh, um, do you want questions throughout it, Kathy? Um, maybe I'll go through the whole thing and then take like the questions the afterward. Questions the yeah, I, I think I think just because the limitations of the technology that might be that might be better. So yeah, so let's hold questions. Okay, I great. would recommend yeah, somebody's giving a suggestion people write, you could write your questions in the chat. And then I could share questions, perhaps that's a great uh, suggestion. So if you have a question for Kathy and write it in the chat. Does that sound okay? Yep, that sounds great. Okay. okay. All right, terrific. And and as I mentioned, I'm I'm keeping my fingers crossed that my internet connection holds. But um, in any case, when I was thinking about tonight's presentation um, and how best to um, how best to present where we are in terms of our curriculum and professional development, where we might want to go. Um, I was looking for a framework and, and I found one um, in the work of a woman named Dina Simmons. Um, it's uh, five steps on how to be an anti-racist educator. And, and I thought taking the time to, to consider each of the points that she makes um, and, and where we are in relation to those points um, might, might be useful for us. So the first thing is that, that she suggests is to engage in vigilant self-awareness. Um, so specifically as asking ourselves these questions, how does your identity provide or prevent access to necessary resources? 
How does your power and privilege show up in your work with students, take up space or silence others? What single narratives are you telling yourself about students? And how does that affect grading, behavior management, and other interactions? And do you and the academic materials you use uphold whiteness or lift up the voices and experiences of people of color? And then the second step would be to acknowledge racism and the ide ideology of white supremacy. So with those two things in mind then, I'd like to talk a little bit about our curriculum and professional development. Um, in terms of our curriculum, um, within our English language arts curriculum, I think I wanna, I wanna mention the um, SEEF grant that was awarded to Pond Cove in 2017. It was entitled Building Understanding and Respect for Cultural Diversity Through Children's Literature. And as a result of this grant, um, teachers were able to um, purchase classroom libraries that um, included the works of um, diverse authors and that focused on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and then they were also given some professional development in the teaching of, of, of those specific books and then also in how to apply what they learn to, um, to literature they would be coming across in, in successive years. Um, it's also become apparent to me in talking with um, teachers, and I know we have a couple of English teachers present tonight, um, that many of them are um, choosing to teach in their required and elective courses um, uh, a, a diverse range of authors um, so that they are, they are Oh, did she freeze? Yep. She'll come back. <laughs> Hopefully. I'm going to send her a little Uh-oh, Kathy. Well, we may want to- There she is. Oh, she's back, okay. Well. Nope, that was you actually. I just sent her a chat. Maybe she got it. Oh. Nope, she's totally gone because her PowerPoint is gone. So right? what, yeah, why don't we move on and maybe she'll come back in. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully she'll ask to be admitted. I see her there, but she's still frozen. So, oh, unfortunate. Okay, so we're gonna move on to Jason Mangerini's and Brie Gallagher for the Racial Equity Institute training to talk to us about that. Great, thank so you. Looks like Kathy's kind of back on. I'm Jason Mangerini's, the principal of Pond Cove and Brie Gallagher is here as well, our guidance counselor from Pond Cove. Um, we're, we're happy to be here tonight to share um, a little bit about uh, some of the training that we've started and um, some of the plans that we're, we were um, beginning to put in motion um, this past school year before the, um, the school closure. So um, last year in November, I attended a training uh, put on by the Racial Equity Institute and um, they're out of Greensboro, North Carolina, and I, my wife is also an educator, and she was attending the training, and she told me about it. So I started to read up on, on the organization, and um, this is work that I'm, I'm quite passionate about, and what really drew me to them was their approach. So rather than a, a you know, one hour or a three hour sit and get PD, it's really, if you, if you go through the series of trainings, it's an 18 month to two year um, experience in, in training experience. Um, and so it's really all about joining the conversation and acknowledging kind of what's going on. And rather than focusing on, um, you know, individual um, bigotry and, and bias, it, the training really focused, the, the phase one training that I attended really focuses on institutions and um, centuries worth of history um, and how racism is, is kind of built into systems and institutions in the United States. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. It's not your typical training. 
um, when you when you arrive, there's no um, tables with white tablecloths and, and water glasses. You're sitting in a circle, nothing in between you and the other. I think there are, maybe it's capped at like 25 members, about 25 um, um, students. And you're facing each other and having difficult, challenging conversations um, the entire time. It's really powerful. Um, I'm going to kind of let Bree fill in before I, I say too much. Bree, I see you down there. Here I am. Uh, Bree Gallagher, school counselor at Panko. Um, so I actually attended the training that was, I believe, in January at USM because um, my sister inconveniently decided to have a baby on the very day that I was supposed to go with Jason. So I did the training a couple months later, but um, I also had a really powerful experience. I, I will... I will admit that I kind of went into it being like, well, I've done a lot of workshops, I've done a lot of sessions, I know about, um, you know, racial equity, I know about equality, I, I, you know, I've kind of got this, and I was amazed and shocked at all of the things that I learned, um, all of the, one of, one of the things I think is really powerful about the phase one training is it really focuses on the historical pieces of racism, like the why, where the term race originated and why racism exists and um, how it's maintained and, and why it's continued to be maintained. Um, so that for me gave me incredible amounts of insight. I, I don't think I really understood what systemic or structural racism was prior to that two day training. So it's really, I think, I think the piece for me that made me feel like it was, um, it was helpful was because it's so powerful and so deep. But one of the things that I think is um, maybe a, a pro and a con is it's, it's, it's long-term work. Like the, the, the phase one is kind of like, slow your roll, <laughs> like stop asking now what, right? And I'm like a now what person, like I want to do it. Okay, what, what should I go do? What do I have to bring back to the school? What, what, what do I have to be doing? And it's like, no, you're not ready. <laughs> like you, you need more, you need more information, you need more learning, you need more analysis. So it's really about analysis and looking at systems and figuring out like, what's the root? And how do we need to change it? Um, and it really made me look at the things I thought I was doing that were really great. <laughs> and, you know, like I have diverse books. So we did that Steve Grant a couple of years ago. Like I really, really pushed myself to make sure that my books were first featuring kids of all colors and then written by authors of all colors. And I thought like, oh, good job, Brie. And um, I gave kids opportunities to talk about difference. And um, when issues of race were brought up, like I said yes to the conversation, especially when it was a students of color. I'm like, oh, great job. And um, I think what the training brought out is just how much is woven into our systems and that that kind of work is just, it's not enough. Um, and it needs it, there, there needs to be deeper work. And I know a, a lot of people that I'm seeing on this Zoom call have mentioned about, you know, that we need to have, um, we need to have black history and Native American history and woven into everything that we're doing. We really need to make sure that this is like what we do all the time. And it's not this separate thing. It's not um, a guidance school counseling thing. It's an everybody thing. So um, I, I could go on and on. The, the, the training was like, I, you left every day like, I need a nap. And I, I think running around after 550 kids at school usually makes me feel like that. But this was, this was really, it was, it was heavy, but really important work. I don't know, Donna, if we should take questions. Like I said, there's like, there's so much. Right, Jason, Jason, did you have anything else that you wanted to say? Or? No, just so, I mean, you know, the plan that Bree and I had had formulated it was to, you know, to train. I I went to a training. Bree went, and then our assistant principal Sarah Forey Pettit was going to go to one. And of course, now they're not, um, they're they're, uh, they're remote. And so, I mean, as much as we're urgent to move forward, we question the the power of it remotely. But I mean, we we hope that they start offering them live again soon. But then, so. Um, just very quickly to explain the process. So what happens is if you go, you go to phase one training and then before you can go to phase two, 
you need to go to phase one again and sit in the outer circle and just watch others receive the phase one training. And you can go back as many times as you want for a phase that you've paid for. Um, and so the plan was for Bree and Sarah and myself to go back to, to send groups, small groups of staff to phase one. And then one of us would sit in the outer circle and support them in that way. And so it would just snowball and others could support their colleagues that way over the next few years. Um, but so everything live is on hold for now. Yeah, we could take questions. Uh, I mean, we're not experts, so we just, just started this, yeah. but anybody has any questions? Yeah. So I just wanna sort of, as I run the meeting, typically in a workshop um, at this point, and I'm looking to other people's faces who are on the board and Donna and Jason, it's time for um, board members and administrators to ask the questions, but I feel like this is such an important conversation that I would like to open it up to everybody. And I just wanna get a nod from the school board members' faces if they feel like that's okay with them or where you stand. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of agreement of that. Um, so it, this conversation can be beyond the board and the administrators um, and to anybody who has questions um, regarding what Jason and Bree had spoken about. And please apologize, there's 41 people. I'm gonna be scrolling up and down and try to see if I see a hand, but if I miss you, please just start to speak up. I'm not seeing any hands raised. I see Phil personally raising his hand, so I'm gonna call on you, Phil. Go ahead. Thank you, and that was very interesting. I didn't know that um, some of our staff or administrators had, trained, had, had attended Rachel Equity Institute. I became first aware of that institution by the Seeing White podcast, which I listened to a couple years ago, and which was a fantastic program. I think I mentioned it to the school board when I first joined at our, at our um, visioning session we had, and I would still recommend it. It's, it's just a fantastic program. Um, which really opened my eyes to a lot of things. It's through the um, it's through the scene on radio. Uh, that's the overall, but it's the second season of scene on radio. It's called Seeing White by John Bewin and Chindrai Kumnika. Um, and then my law firm actually brought in, and this is where my question comes. My law firm actually brought in the Racial Equi uh, Equity Institute um, for a general training. It's clearly not going to be as intensive as as people need, but um, but we felt it was important to bring it to the whole firm and they do that kind of thing. And I know they have an outpost in Lewiston. And what I was wondering is, um, obviously it's a challenging budget environment, but this is important, important to spend our money on, is if there's anything we could do back when, it's, when we do get together, or maybe even a remote way, that would open it up beyond um, you know, a few people who could attend. Um, and even, even if it's sort of uh, an initial introductory session, I think that's at least an important step to start the conversation um, in that way. Yeah. Okay. So I think. We've all we've... Here. Okay. Sorry. I, th I think. Uh -huh. um, so to answer, was it Phil? Is that who was talking? Um, to answer his question, I think Kathy, before she got cut off, <laughs> was going to talk about how uh, she has um, looked into uh, the cost and what it might look like to have. REI come to us. So I think that's an avenue that's being explored, but that um, my understanding that was part of, you know, coming here today was to talk about, you know, different next steps and kind of look at, you know, what might be the best fit. But yes, I think that's something that, you know, Jason, when, when he had, when he had come to me about um, the, the training, his, you know, he, he, there was always a plan to train more and extend it out as we were able to afford. So Sorry, Jason, I totally spoke for you. No, I think that's great, but I think Kathy, <laughs> I don't know if Kathy can talk, can, can say anything now. I can, I'm living in fear of <laughs> my internet connection going unstable once more. For those of you who don't know, I am in Garrett County, Maryland, which is the westernmost county uh, uh, in Maryland. Um, it was the only week of the entire summer that my entire family could gather together. Um, and so here I am. So my apologies. I'm not sure when I got cut off exactly. Um, I'd like to go back to the presentation. I'm not. Oh no. Yeah. 
wishful thinking. Uh huh. Maybe. She was good this morning. We had a meeting and she was fine. But um, I do know that there are a few other questions out there. So while she's on hold, and especially before we go on to her presentation, I'm going to call on Gina Tapp. So if you want to unmute yourself. And you know, there we go. You should be all set. Hi. So I was wondering, um, from what I was listening to, that sounds like a really good plan, but like, what happens in the case of you've got a like 99.9% .9 white student population and all of a sudden you get a student of color or a student from another country or whatever, like, can the, can the plan be adapted to like, okay, now we have a real situation, we need to adapt to it in real life versus our plan is in three months we do this, in six months we do this, in one year we do this. How, how does that like, how does like real world situations factor into the plan? Sure, so, I mean, I guess I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, we, those real life situations occur all the time, <clears throat> which, is, which is, you know, what um, made us realize how important this work is. So, I mean, in terms of, um, can, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit more on like how a plan might be adjusted? I mean, so we're, we're, I think the plan would be to move forward with as much momentum as, as time and money would allow. Um, sure. But so could you, could you add to that a little bit so I could understand? Sure. So I'll give you my real life example, which is we um, took in our daughter who came from the DRC from the expo in August of last year. And we brought her to Cape Elizabeth schools and had her meet with guidance counselors and got her all signed up and she like everybody like just came in and did whatever was needed and she had a great first freshman year and I'm thinking okay so here's this real life experience where this thing happened and everybody did what was necessary and learned and um, did what was needed how does that fit into like the overall plan of okay we're going to do this yeah, I mean, Bree might be able to speak to it better, but I think, I mean, it, the overall plan is to like build that capacity for everyone to have a deeper understanding and, and um, just respond to every situation appropriately. Um, do you have anything to add, Bree? Yeah, I think, um, like going back to what I said before, that before I took the training, I was like, you know, I think I do these things well, like when a, a student makes or a racially insensitive comment. I feel like I've done a good job supporting the student who was who was hurt by by the comment, helping to teach and support the student that made the comment and their families. Um, so that I, I'm connecting that in that when we've had students that are from different backgrounds have speak different languages or um, are from different cultures, we do rally around those kids. And we're lucky here in Cape to have the resources to be able to do that. And I do think we do that well. I think the hope and the dream is for everyone to, to have the capacity to be able to really think about our whole system and how we create a system that everybody whether you're new, new like it's almost in some ways it's almost easier when a kid is like which it sounds like with 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 your daughter is that right gina yeah. that it sounds like with your daughter it was really clear okay she's gonna need supports right i sometimes worry about the kids that it's not always that clear and i've heard some of our students of color that are students that i was like oh my gosh i i didn't know that they were struggling i didn't know that they felt that way right like we want we want to create a system where we're noticing all of those things and we're asking those questions and we're really analyzing all the time. Does that answer your question? Yes, and I think um, I'll just add to that that I think the CAPE has done an amazing job at just um, recruiting and choosing educators that regardless of this is whether or not this is their area of expertise, they're just such great educators that they naturally know what they need to do to help students, whether or not, you know, equity and diversity happens to be their expertise, they're just fabulous. And I just feel really thankful that we've had that experience with the Cape Schools. 
Thank you. Um, okay. I'm probably going to pronounce your name wrong. I apologize. Shukriya, you have your hand up. Please unmute and you can speak. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Um, thank you. And you said my name perfectly. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize. Uh, I'm coming a little late to the discussion. I did hear Gina Tapp's um, um, comments. And just to let you know, she is um, an HR manager in the city of Portland. And I work in the city of Portland as well. Um, I do appreciate what she's saying. I, I think, you know, a lot of us gravitate towards, you know, to Cape Elizabeth for the schools and only for the schools. We were, we've been here for, um, we moved here when my niece was two months old. My eldest niece was two months old. So that's about 23 years. We've been here in, grew up in Portland, came here to um, Cape Elizabeth about 23 years ago. And I left, I had gone to college, came back and actually moved to Cape Elizabeth um, and, you know, paid into the taxes until my kids could take, you know, basically join. Um, but it's, uh, I appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate what you're doing. Um, I think a lot of things are being done because I, you know, as you know, the Cape Diversity Coalition came out of, um, I think we're telling this story so many times now, but the, uh, the coalition came out of um, two of my uh, niece and nephew being treated wrong when the day of the election, when Trump was, I don't want to say Trump, but this current um, uh, administration was um, had won, mm -hmm. and people were telling my, you know, my nephew to go back to his country, and he didn't make a big deal out of it. Oh, thank God there was another person who was standing there, heard all of it, and did mention it to Mr. Shed, who's on this call too. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the, the discussion has started four years ago with all this. Um, it has started with that. Um, it's been very, very difficult. Um, I believe, you know, having a parent um, who can advocate for you and then having a parent, a person of color, maybe language barrier, it's hard. It is defi definitely hard. Like I said, I appreciate what Gina had to say because I think as a person who can speak English and speak up for the kids, it's great, you know. Um, but we need to... I think we need to take the conversation to another level. We need to hear from people of color. We need to hear from the, the diverse population of Cape Elizabeth. We need to hear from the minorities from Cape Elizabeth. And I'm not sure how many of you had attended um, the rally, uh, it was Wednesday. There was one on Sunday with the parents and there was one day. It was humongous. There were so many people showed up, not as many as people I would love for. I know there's more people there in Cape that believe in this. And it, it, was, it was really emotional. All the voices of the kids, um, current kids, 10 year old kid talking about, you know, about his racism here in Cape Elizabeth to people who graduated, people have been called the N-word, people have been called terrorists. We need to address that. Why don't, I appreciate, like I said, I, you have to understand, I do appreciate all the training that the teachers are going. But four years ago, we, we stated, we need someone that looks like us. We need someone that speaks like us. We need someone that represents our culture. We have a, you know, a ELL, uh, program, but it's run by a white person. Uh, why can't we hire someone who has different culture behind them, who comes from multiple, multiple cultures? We need to have these discussion. We need to open this um, workshop to the people and we have to listen. We have to listen because you can't make progress without listening to, um, to all these stories that have been going on in Cape Elizabeth. And I honestly think it was so much, but after hearing these kids talk, it hurts you. It pulls at your uh, heartstrings. It's, it's, it's not pretty. It is not pretty. And we are 
I'm talking sure. about. Uh, you know, we're an exceptional group here in Cape Elizabeth, and I think we can we can be the leaders of mm -hmm. a diverse, you know, so-called UN town when it comes to school. And you know, teachers are everything. Teachers, it begins with the teachers. All of this begins with the teacher. I won't even go towards what needs to be taught in school or what needs to be there in school. But I just wanna, I wanna ask you if you could please open up the uh, forum for people to voice their, their concerns or their stories with you. That will be great. Thank you. Thank you for those words, Shukriya. Um, I have Melanie Thomas has raised her hand. If you wanna unmute and speak. Melanie? Hi. Hi, can Hi. you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I think this workshop is great. I'm more about moving forward and wanting to um, see some action. Um, I have a rising seventh grader and a rising fourth grader um, in the Cape Elizabeth school systems. And I just don't want the school systems to fail my children the way I was failed um, growing up here in Maine and going through the entire school systems here at Maine. Um, and that was a while ago. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about how you're implementing changes, um, what you're going to do, um, hiring more people of color, um, changing your curriculum, um, promoting Black history, Native Americans, um, more books of color, um, and of course, um, training. Uh, I, I do like what I'm hearing about that, but um, I, I'd like to see more of that. And most of these things should have been done um, a long time ago uh, to at least represent us or uh, school, even the 99% that are white here, that they need that education as well. They, they need to see it know it um, and um, have good conversations about mm -hmm. it. So I'm more about um, changing policies and um, I, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, like I said, I have uh, been through the school systems here in Maine and uh, it's very lacking. It was very shameful. And by the time I got into high school, I was uh, very lost. I mean, saying the Pledge of Allegiance um, and liberty and justice for all uh, got really tiring around high school when I realized there aren't liberties and justice for um, people of color. Um, I, I had no African American teachers. I, I had nobody of any type of color uh, to mm -hmm. represent me, uh, and I certainly wasn't taught that. Um, and I just don't think it is the parents' responsibility at all times to um, teach. Uh, their children of color. Uh, I, I think it's, it's twofold that white people need to know it, black people need to know it, Native Americans, we all need to know that. Um, and I, and I, I also think that Kate could um, change the narrative. More, more people will look at you and what you're doing and the stances that you're making and the implementations that you're making uh, to make our school system better um, for all. And, and I believe they'll, they'll follow your lead. Um, so I, I'm, I'm looking for that to be done um, in action to be done immediately um, and not just on paper, but I want, I, want, I want to see that. I want to see that for my kids. I do. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Melanie. Um, and just a reminder that if you have spoken and you're complete, if you could put your hand down digitally, um, that will help me know that you don't have anything mm -hmm. more to say. Um, there's a woman, Sarah, S-A-I-R-A, -A, that had her hand raised and she just Hi. disappeared. Oh, there you are. Hi. Great. Yeah, I just I lowered my hand. Yeah. Hi, I'm Thanks. Saira uh, Shear. I'm Nasser's daughter and Shukriya's uh, niece. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. so how my aunt said, um, the protest from, I think it was probably a week and a half ago, it was it was great. Um, a lot, a lot of Cape students, um, current students and alumni talked, and we were there until very, very late, like 9:30. And it really dawned to me that we were there so late, and there were so many students. It was because that the Cape student, people of color, 
have been silenced for so long and their voices aren't being heard by the Cape schools, which is very unfortunate and disappointing. Um, I personally went through the Cape systems too. I went to Ponco, the middle school and high school. And I can say that everything I have learned was from outside of Cape Elizabeth. And I have learned nothing beneficial with Black history or other experiences in Cape Elizabeth. And it's that's unfortunate because Cape has a reputation. It's very it's known as an elite school when you're we're literally being taught the same thing as during high school or Portland High School or Scarborough. So yeah, that was very disappointing at the protest. I'm um, glad people did show up. Um, I would have loved to see more people, but it's a pandemic, so we can't really and not have everyone show up. But um, I wanted to talk about um, the kids and um, the how their racism is affecting uh, um, people of color students and black people students as well. Um, we, this not, is bullying and then it's racism on top is traumatizing for them and it's deteriorating their mental health, which as a school, you guys, shouldn't be acting upon you guys should try to look for ways to decrease that also the implicit bias and racism just doesn't come from the students it also comes from teachers from teachers having to read saying the n-word during when reading books um allowed during classes and thinking that it's okay that enforces students to think that it's okay to send the, say the n-word so they continue saying the n-word also students um sorry, teachers who mistake one uh, person of color with another person co of color in mm. classes. There's literally, there would be only two students and they would mix them up. And also the fact that teachers are culturally appropriating black culture. There is the um, teachers, there was a teacher who had dreadlocks um, and black students are expelled, um, fired from the jobs because of dreadlocks. So. I don't know how you guys want to address that, but that is concerning. Also, um, so what I would like to see in Cape since I, I'm out of it, but I still have cousins and um, siblings in the system. Um, you guys need to change your curriculum, first of all, um, especially history curriculum during junior year. There's a one year of US history and barely any time is spent on black history or Native American history. And that needs to be changed. Literally, you can take one month out of the whole school year and you can use Netflix shows or books uh, to educate the students, which is very important. Also bias training for um, teachers is very, very important because since they are the ones who are teaching the uh, kids so what they are teaching needs to be correct and it needs to be taught properly. <clears throat> um, lastly, uh, students um, who say racist or Islamophobic or xenophobic or homophobic things need to be held accountable. They, they will grow up to be racist teachers, lawyers, healthcare workers, or law enforcement, and the cycle will just continue. So as a school system, it's your job to stop the formation of these kinds of people. And it also goes, um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I wanna say. Um, I really do wanna see change in Cape Elizabeth schools. Um, it is a good school, but it has to be better, especially since you got, we had, there's literally less than a hundred residents, I'm sure of other people of color. And if you guys can't back them up, then, that's really concerning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna get to Maureen Clancy in just a second, but I just wanna bring attention to the group chat that there is some conversation happening, some resources being written down um, and offered, I'm sorry, being offered. So to take a little peek at that. Um, Maureen, thank you for being here. Go ahead, if you can unmute. And then you have the floor. Is Maureen here, Clancy? Um, 
Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just frozen. But it looks like I'm not frozen anymore. Has Maureen spoken up? No. No. Okay. Um, and I don't see anybody else with questions at this point. I'm looking. Um, Maureen, send me a private chat if you get this and would like to speak again. Um, and I think we have Kathy back with a hot spot, ready to go. Yeah, it's a charm, girl. Let's do it. Okay, hopefully, three times a charm. Can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> yes, okay, yes, all right, good, okay, great, all right, so. Um, unfortunately, I've missed a lot of the conversation, and so um, I guess I'll just proceed um, as though I, all right, I'm getting nods from several people, so I will, I will do that um, and uh, go right back to where I believe I left off, which was, a, with what, which was with a discussion of the work that we're starting to do around Maine Native Americans at Pond Cove. Is that correct? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Good. So, all right. So, um, so as I mentioned, um, the, uh, the Maine Department of Education has revised its um, social studies uh, standards and um, they're giving greater weight now appropriately to um, the experience of Maine Native Americans. Um, and I think that um, it, so it is our intention to um, devote the um, second grade social studies curriculum to, um, to as much of an in-depth exploration of the main Native Americans um, as you can get at that age. Um, but I think, and I did hear this, um, I think it's important to note that um, it, is, it is not enough to do a one and done and that we need to integrate our study of the main Native Americans um, throughout our curriculum and not just have this be um, something that the, that the um, second grade teachers are taking on and nobody else has to think about in the same way that Black History Month, while it was well-intentioned, is, is, uh, is, is not enough. Um, and then at the middle school, and again, remember, these are sort of recent initiatives. Um, you're familiar, I, I, I believe, with the sabbatical proposal that is going to be um, once Laura Briggs has completed it, is going to be looking at U.S. history in the eighth grade through the lens of migration. And that is going to include um, a, a required field service um, component. Um, but that is, again, a, a way of, of looking at um, the American experience um, in the eighth grade that we have not done before. Um, then at the high school, um, the Holocaust course um, has adopted the, excuse me, the Facing History in Ourselves curriculum. And um, this is, uh, this is a, a, a curriculum that starts by asking students to consider their identity. And um, Mary Page, who, um, who teaches this course, shared with me a story that I thought was instructive and I wanted to share it, that um, at the beginning, uh, she asks students to label themselves. And she observed that, uh, you know, who are they? And she observed that when she has students of color in her class, that they will refer to themselves as black or, to, or brown, or perhaps they're Muslim or they're gay. Um, but that the students who, who comprise that majority don't think to label themselves as white or as Christian um, or as heterosexual. Um, and so that, um, that, I think, is starting to get at um, the identity work, I hope, that uh, Dina Simmons was referring to. Um, and then we have um, some of our U.S. history teachers working with the 1619 Project. Some of you may be familiar with this. This is an initiative 
um, started by Nicole Hannah-Jones of the New York Times Magazine, um, but looking at um, the experience of African Americans, 1619 is when um, African slaves were first brought to the North American colonies. Um, and then we also have teachers who are using the Zen education project lessons. Um, and again, this is an alternative to that standard textbook curriculum. Howard Zinn wrote A People's History of the United States. Um, and so it's an effort to, um, to look at those more diverse vo voices and not just tell the um, history from the perspective of the white presidents, for example. In terms of professional development, Jason and Bree talked about the Racial Equity Institute. We're going to be hearing from folks about the Leadership Academy experience they had this year. So I'll move on to um, ideas for moving forward. Um, again, uh, this is brainstorming that had occurred um, as a result of the conversations um, that I was having in preparation for this uh, for this workshop. Um, we recognize the need to examine our entire curriculum. This has already been said, I think, by some of the most recent people to speak, whom I got to hear, um, through an anti-racist lens with the intent, as uh, Dina Simmons says, to lift up the voices and experiences of people of color. Um, I'm happy to report that this work is already starting this summer. Several of our teachers applied for summer work projects. They're going to be doing this work in both social studies and in art, um, and that's K-12. Um, I think it's important um, that we look at our uh, disciplinary and on honors and AP course enrollment data. Um, do um, our, are our students of color being disciplined um, to the same ratio as they comprise the population and same for their enrollment in our honors and AP courses? And then as has been discussed, we're hoping to partner with organizations that are skilled at surfacing and addressing individual and systemic racism. Um, in addition to the Racial Equity Institute, there's the Community Change, Inc. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the, um, with the blog Black Girl in Maine um, and the executive director, um, the, the author of that is the executive director of this Community Change, Inc. And that might be an organization we want to consider partnering with. Great Schools Partnership, we, they have been our school coaches for the past three years. They're affiliated with the uh, National Equity Project another possible organization. And then we have done some work with Seize This Peace. Honestly, I don't know to what extent they're engaged in. All right, returning then to the framework that I began with, um, steps three, four, and five in how to be an anti-racist educator are to study and teach representative history. Again, we've already heard um, a, a plea for that. Um, the importance of talking about race with students um, and then finally, when you see racism, do something. So again, to what extent are, all we, are we already doing this? Um, bearing in mind that there is always room for improvement. So, um, but Pond Cove, we have a social emotional curriculum called Responsive Classroom. All of our Pond Cove educators have been trained in this. Um, it is, um, it's an approach to teaching and, and, and just, discipline that focuses on creating inclusive classrooms and um, culturally sensitive approaches. Um, I, 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 it's possible that Bree and, and Jason already spoke about responsive classroom. Again, I was out for a bit, and if they haven't and you're interested in that, that's something we could come back to. Um, our counseling curriculum at Pond Coven Middle School does touch on, um, on some of these issues, um, they focus on empathy building, they focus on identity, on marginalization, um, and that would be, that, that, that is throughout Pond Cove, um, and then really emphasized um, in fifth, fifth through eighth grade um, by our two school counselors. Um, and then the high school social studies curriculum, actually starting in seventh grade, um, it was, I, and I, I've seen this in the classes that I observed, that there is an attempt to connect um, whatever is in the formal, the written curriculum, to things that are happening um, currently. Um, and then in terms of U.S. history and government, and these are required courses in the 8th grade, the 11th grade, and the 12th grade, um, 
there are there are Native American units. Um, there's discussion of Ida B. Well, Ida B. Wells is reporting on lynching. There is attention to the Japanese internment camps. Um, there to Red Summer, to the Tulsa massacre. There are these are things that are discussed um, in in our curriculum. Um, and I think we can have conversations um, about the extent to which they are successful. Um, and um, and 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 how we might um, make it so that our students don't graduate with the perception that they have not been exposed to these to these topics. Um, as far as student and staff training go, um, the middle school um, the middle school one of the two middle school counselors and the middle school tech integrator tech integrator run the civil rights team. This, um, they are a member of the Civil Rights Team Project, and they um, that is a way for them to address some of these issues. Uh, back in the 2015-2016 school year, we had Steve Wessler from the Center for Prevention of Hate Violence train staff in a train-the-trainer model. Um, he also worked with students, um, so that is another possibility. Um, and administrators who are going to be participating in a four-day summer institute on reimagining education, teaching, learning, and leading for a racially just society. We hope, too, that will jumpstart the conversation. And then finally, um, some of you may have read the article um, in this morning's Bangor Daily News about the experience of um, some Black students at Bangor High School and um, I think one of the things that concerned me the most was that um, was that the students reported having shared things that happened to them with teachers, with administrators, and that no action was taken. And that that pained me, um, and I a great deal. And I just I just wanted to remind everyone that we have um, we have policies and procedures um, that are specifically designed to prevent discrimination and harassment on the basis of race, on the basis of color and religion and gender identity and expression. And if, and, and I realize maybe policies and procedures aren't enough, but I just wanted to emphasize that we, we do have them um, and we make every effort to follow them. And then connected to that, ideas for moving forward, doing what we're doing right now, which is listening to some of our students and families of color, studying our issue, studying these issues. Uh, there have been suggestions made, people I've spoken to, that we have community reason discussions, um, that we provide cultural competence, anti-bias, anti-racist training to our staff and students, expand our curricular diversity, and beyond what I've, well beyond what I've described tonight. Um, and that we recruit a more diverse faculty. Does that complete And yes, I just wanted to, yes, and that, that, that does, thank you. Froze, but I, that does, okay. Thank you for that. Um, there are a few hands raised. I'm going to see if Maureen can come back in now. If you... Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I can see you. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I got a new set of headphones today and I was using them for the first time because my family's sick of listening to me and all my Zooms and that somehow interrupted my um, ability to speak. So thank you okay. for allowing me to join you tonight and thank you for uh, I think Kathy covered a lot of the issues I was going to say. Um, I think that we have an opportunity, having gone to these workshops, we have an opportunity to listen to our students of color, especially our graduates, and hear their experience and figure this out. I truly believe everyone in Cape Elizabeth Schools wants our students to have a wonderful experience. But knowing how to talk about race, knowing how to address these issues, knowing how to deal with them, is not always something people have been 
um, are comfortable with and know how to deal with these issues. So I think we really need to explore those things. Um, I would love our community to become more diverse, but that isn't going to happen in the short term. So I think our focus should be becoming an anti-racist mm -hmm. school. Raising, yes, I am, please. Raising kids who will be anti-racist. We are raising the leaders of tomorrow. We know that in our district. A majority of our kids go on to college. They will be the CEOs, the presidents, the pr superintendents, the, the principals of tomorrow. And if we don't raise them with an anti-racist framework, then we are failing the future generation in the system. So I think that should be our focus and our intention. And that includes all the things that Kathy just said, looking at our curriculum. If we are going to read Huck Finn and To Kill a Mockingbird, are we prepared to talk about them in the right way? Are we prepared to address this? And are we also showing them and having them read books where people of color are forceful and in good place and not being the people who are being taken care of and the people who are mentally disabled. And we have to show them different views of people. Um, I learned, I feel like my education after listening to Seeing White and reading other books by Ibrahim Kindi, I realized how whitewashed my education was. I know about Martin Luther King, I know about Frederick Doug Douglass, but I didn't learn about Angie Thomas or Sojourner Truth or many of the other amazing black people who, um, and Hispanics who um, shaped our world. So we need to look at those pieces. Um, we need to see what they're reading. I really think we have a Holocaust class, class, which is great, but I really think we should have the history of race in America in our high schools. And we should teach our students those, those classes and those issues. Um, and I think, you know, it's one thing to go to training it's another thing to figure out how to incorporate this in what we say and do every day. I really think, you know, personally myself, the reason that I, I, I still feel that I'm a racist, I'm still working towards being an anti-racist, but a lot of it is my experience. I work with 12 people who come from Asia, Africa, South America, Central America. I now know that Asia is, uh, Africa is not a country, it's a continent and that Sudan and Somalia and, Angola and DRC are all very different places with very different cultures and very different um, histories. So I think we having people like that amongst us makes a big difference. So being focused on hiring teachers and administrators and people in our school systems of color will help all of us become more anti-racist. Um, and not to put that pressure on them, but it's just part of the learning, part of being with people who don't look like you um, is always an important piece of it. So I know that Cape Elizabeth wants to do this. It's just figuring out the right path to, to do it well and to do it efficiently. And I think I was so struck by the speakers of our, our high school students at those um, uh, forums. And we really need to figure out a way to listen to them, engage them and ask them to help us move forward. So thank you for your time. Thank you for that, Maureen. I have up next um, Khadija. I'm not sure if I said that name right. Are you here? Paula, see your hand up. There's a few other people ahead of you. I will call on you. Um, Khadija, if you can yes. unmute. There you go. Hello. Hello, hi. Hi. So, Khadija here. I want to mention a few things. Um, first of all, thank you to you, all of you white people who showed up for this. Um, I'm getting a bit tired of the political correctness of the whole thing, where everybody's trying to say the right things. We have to try and be inclusive. We have to try and do this and that and change school. But I worry that this being the thing at the moment, at the end of the day, we're gonna go back to what was before. Those, any of you realize the power that you actually do have. Those white people know the privilege that they have as white people. Those white people know how it feels to be black. 
So no white person can speak for me and speak about my experience as a black mother. No white woman can speak about my experience as a black woman. So I resent the fact that at some point we're gonna end up hiring or just putting a few teachers into um, a few seminars and they're gonna come back and try to teach black history. No white person should be teaching black history because they don't really know what it means to be a black person. They don't really understand the whole thing. So they're just gonna take a few course, um, not check their white privilege, not check their white fragility, because there is that also going on where no one is checking their white fragility. No one is checking their white privilege. All of a sudden now that we all are woke, we can learn about black history and teach it. I resent that. I would like for Cape Elizabeth to hire black teacher to come and teach black history. Even if it wasn't for a full year, even if the teacher was only part-time, I'm okay with that. Then having a white person just learning a few pages while they themselves don't even know that they're racist. I will advise most of you, if, not, if nobody has read it yet, to go and read a few books about white privilege. So you actually know, and white fragility to actually know what it is that you do have, what is your power? How is it that you always racist toward us even when you are not trying? Because most racist people don't know that they are racist. I meet a lot of people in Cape who talk to me very nicely in some weird type of white people voices that I just smile, but I know, okay, that voice is racist. Why are you talking to me like that? I don't want to be complimented on my English. Guess what? It's a language. It's not a big deal. It's not an accomplishment. I don't want people to approach me and give me the weird smile. Oh, poor Muslim lady with her hijab. It's not a punishment. It's a choice. So once everybody has learned, and I don't think it's going to happen in one day. I'm not saying go and educate yourself today and tomorrow come back as, you know, walk. But I'm saying... Let's face it first. Once we have faced it, then we can talk about everything else that is being said here. It's all nice on papers. All I'm hearing, all I've been hearing for the last few weeks, the meeting that I've been coming to, it's all nice on paper. I doubt change will happen maybe because of many years of seeing the same thing over and over. And I have hope that change will happen but I hope that change will happen in the right way where there is education, where we can all go back and educate ourselves in what really matters and how to express our thought without it being just a fixed smile. I really cannot take any more fixed smile from you white people. Come on. Let's be open about what is going on. Admit to the fact that most of you don't really know your privilege. Most of you don't really understand what it means to be black. And don't speak for me. You can't tell me what it means to be a black mother if I'm the one who stay up at night while you're sleeping. And your experiences are completely different to my experience. I don't want to sound bitter. I don't want to sound angry. Actually, I am angry. I am sounding angry and franchement, I don't care. As long as we're facing it, I'll be okay with what will come next. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, next up is Halima. If you can unmute yourself. Hi. You should be able to speak. Hi, Halima. Hello. Um, so I'm Halima. I uh, graduated last year. Um, my dad is on the school board, Nasser, and my sister is Syra, who spoke, and she took some of the good points away, so I'm going to be <laughs> Um, but so, I have my brother with me too, Adil, he is a rising, uh, freshman. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to talk about some of the stuff that has been happening the, for the amount of time that I have been at Cape. And so, but uh, Sister Khadija said a lot of the good points, like um, about having uh, a class that's for 
black history because like, like for example i took holocaust um my uh, i think it was junior year and uh, it was such an amazing class i learned so much about um the holocaust and the nazis all that stuff and i did not know anything about it honestly in that class actually um educated me so we had a class for black history that a black teacher um uh, you know uh, taught us and taught the students then that would give them uh, more uh knowledge about the black history and the correct knowledge too because honestly the t uh, history teachers that are in high the high school are not really educated on the black history yes but also like islam too because like i remember i was taking i was um studying like the religions in uh high and high school and uh the teacher that i had said one of the, some of this like such bad information and like wrong information about islam and then i had to correct him as a student i had to correct him and say no this is not correct information and it was not only me it was my cousin too had correct the same teacher over and over saying this is not the correct information so out there there's people getting those wrong information and you saying oh no those are the right information when it's totally not so i feel like t educating the teachers will be helpful too and like i've heard people saying um that the english teachers are saying are making them say the n-word and I haven't said the N-word when I'm reading a book because the teachers I've had um, did not say it, do not make me say it, unlike um, some other teachers that I have. And just, uh, I think those are the two points. And the other is just like, people saying the N-word, white people saying the N-word is just, it gets me so mad because it's not their word, it's not, you know, um, they should be educated on that too and it starts at such a young age too because like my brother comes home and says oh my fr uh classmates are giving are asking me for the n-word pass when he is not even black he, he's he's a he's a person of color but he is not black so people should not be asking him for the n-word pass and they shouldn't even be saying it yeah and so like it's just um kind of annoying because like at such a young age kids are being are saying these racist stuff and like they always um he comes home and says oh yeah someone said uh say a terrorist joke oh someone said the n-word or someone like said oh i can say the n-word because i'm brown no that's not how it works yeah so i think those are just some of the points that i have uh i have but you want to say anything? um there are many students in my grade or in the eighth grade, soon to be ninth grade. Um, they, during soccer practices and basketball practices, have been saying the N-word and have been asking me to say the N-word and give them the N-word pass, which I have not been happy about that. I've been tempted to hurt them sometimes, <laughs> but I have never actually done it. And yeah. Basically, yeah. what? Islamic jokes or? Um, I also get told a lot of terrorist jokes and yeah yeah and like i feel like um as a person who has been bullied too uh from almost my entire life i feel like this is um a sign of bullying especially um getting terrorist jokes though know, like when i was growing up i was called a towel head i was going oh are you hiding a gun in your hijab or whatever and like seeing my cousins or siblings getting going through the same thing is just annoying and my aunt said this too i'm pretty sure we have demanded change four years ago and nothing has happened and sadly someone has to be killed for you guys to make change and uh when four years ago when the president was elected i was told to go back my brother was told to go back to his country and there was a, a school bus full of students who did not stand up for him. There was a bus driver who did not stand up for him. And when I was in the hallway, when someone said, oh, now that um, Muslims are, now that Trump is elected, Muslims can go back to where they belong. And honestly, I, at that moment, I did not, want to, I did not say anything because I was just, 
in shock. And when I turned around, I just, it was just a bunch of people. I didn't know who it was, but it was just disgusting how no one stood up for me or knew I was standing right in front of them. And like, I told my dad and I, you know, I just, I learned my lesson to tell my dad, and, you know, when I'm getting bullied or whatever. So we went to the school board, we went to the principal, nothing happened. And now that George Floyd died, Breonna Taylor died, Ahmed Arbery, many of these victims, the black people who have died, now you guys are standing up and wanting to change. And that's all I wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. Um, thank you. Um, up next is Amy Stanley. If you can unmute yourself, there you go. I think you're- Yep, can you Amy, hear me? Are you there? Can yes, you thank you, Amy. Yes. Well, my name is Amy Stanley and I live uh, at 10 Abaco Drive in the Oakhurst neighborhood. I have had three, children's, ch three children attend Cape schools over the last uh, 12 years from kindergarten to Pond Cove uh, to high school graduation. Uh, and through the years, I've been a volunteer at, at the schools in many capacities. Uh, in fact, my work for the schools prompted me to go back to school to get my master's in teaching as a history teacher. And I currently teach history at another high school in Cumberland County, and I'm also the, the civil rights uh, faculty advisor. Um, I wanted to speak tonight as a proud yet concerned Cape citizen, as a school's champion and a history teacher, and someone who believes Black Lives Matter. I recognize that we are at an inflection point in our country's and our town's history. And I think the time is now that we take advantage of this opportunity to acknowledge that systemic racism is not just a part of our past, but it continues as a blight and a reality here in Cape Elizabeth, throughout our state and our country. You only have to have heard the words just spoken here by Halima and the words of people of color at the uh, forums over the last weeks um, and the testimony at last night's council meeting to understand that. I think we need to take actions to make our schools more welcoming and less hostile for students of color. Uh, and I think it's the school board's role to lead this effort uh, and go beyond just general statements of what's been done um, and to um, come up with specific actions. Um, and one important area I think is history instruction um, that I can speak to a little bit as a history teacher. Um, I suggest as, uh, in my context as a history teacher that the school board take a deep dive into how, what, and when we deliver social studies curriculum from the kindergarten into uh, through uh, grade 12. It can't all be on the teachers to decide for themselves what to include and what to exclude from the curriculum. Having taught the US, US history this past school year, there is so much and too much material to cover in a year's time. And I think teachers need direction from the school board uh, to, to determine what are the things what are the pri priorities we have as a school district for inclusion? Um, too often the accomplishments of people of color have been left out and events that paint a complicated picture of our country's uh, white supremacist legacy have been glossed over. These omissions, as we have heard here tonight, have a deleterious impact on black students and students of color. They also, um, these omissions also have negative consequences for all Cape students. Change at the school level is vital to changing society. Um, from what I understand, some state boards of education and interest groups are further along in this area. And I think that Cape, the Cape Elizabeth School Board should study the efforts that have already been made and to decide how to move forward. But in the meantime, um, not just 
wait for, you know, studying something over the long term, the board should adopt changes related to curriculum that can be put into action right away, starting in the fall. I thank you for your time and your generous commitment to children in this town. Thank you, Amy. Um, Paul S had his hand raised, if he'd like to jump in now. Sure, uh, my name is Paul Seidman and I live at 21 Oakview Drive. I have a few, um, few things just to rattle off sort of suggestions or, or things that people of color have brought to me. And then, um, and then I'll make sort of a final point. So um, a few things just in listening to what everyone else was saying, especially teachers in terms of what you all are doing. Um, are, are, are Jews as Jews talked about outside of the context of the Holocaust in a, in a structured way? Um, do students know about black Jews? Um, if uh, wondering if you've reached out to reach um, uh, a pro-indigenous group um, in Maine who have educational materials. So I wanted to recommend that. Uh, I wanted to recommend the practice of land acknowledgement, which REACH can um, share more with you about uh, each day in school or, or if, if the Pledge of Allegiance is, is done, then perhaps before that. I wanted to mention, uh, ask if Huck Finn and Mockingbird are taught as white hero stories and the problem with that being the case. I wanted to mention a book called An Indigenous People's History of the United States for Young People um, by Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. And I wondered when patriarchy is talked about critically in the, in the K through 12 system. Um, and um, finally, what I, last night was a town council meeting a workshop and meeting, and several people of color spoke very passionately, um, including some here who've already spoken. And um, and the action that was taken was a racist action, which which um, uh, I think they would acknowledge with with some discussion, which was about signage and what words would go on the sign, and. Um, and so one of the one of the issues I think that's central to um, this matter is for those of us who are white is to whom are we accountable in the decisions that we make because without a real system of accountability to people of color in this community in terms of do you feel this will work what effect do you think this will have uh, is this meaningful change without that then what happens what happened at the town council meeting is what happens which is you take in all the information we take it in and make decisions that aren't necessarily even responsive to what has been shared so i just want to encourage you to as a as a matter of course to to actively create uh structures of accountability thanks a lot Thank you for that. Um, next is Eliza Matheson. Hi, Hi can you hear me? Hi. Yes, Hi. welcome. Um, much uh, of what has already been said has, um, is what I uh, hope to come to the table with, so I will try and keep this brief. Um, I grew up in Cape Elizabeth. I, K through 12 here. Um, I moved back here with my family. I have two children who will be going through the K system. One of the kindergarten, so I'm here for the long haul. I got another one coming up behind. Um, and uh, first and foremost, I, I hearing the stories as of late um, have been painful and awful to hear, and I want to apologize and say I'm so sorry that we are so late to this. Um, that we have not been doing enough for you um, and that your experiences have uh, gone unnoticed or without change. Um, and we, I understand that at, the, at many different levels we have some bystander training, um, but I think it needs to be incredibly explicit starting in, in the Pond Cove school system um, 
about addressing addressing inequity, addressing bias, addressing all of the um, power that white people carry in society as part of a racist society. Um, and I don't claim to be an expert in any of this. I'm learning as much as everybody else is as we go through um, my former position, my last position was at Bowdoin College at the in the College Wide Initiative for um, first year students um, coming in, first generation, low income students of color. Um, and the overwhelming data from K through 12 and all in the post-secondary is that those students need to be heard and supported um, through systemic change, not one-offs, not, um, you know, this happened and now we fixed it. We, as everybody has said, need to be looking K through 12 at what we are teaching what are we modeling um, and telling our students that they have a responsibility um, as part of this community to um, stand up for their peers and reach out to an adult who can handle, effectively handle the, um, the situation at hand. Addition, and that will require training that will require a huge investment in our staff, in our faculty, in our admin, in everybody at every level um, to have some anti-bias training and how this works. This ideally would be led by um, people of color and black people in our community. That's a huge burden, and I, I hope that we are not just asking that of them, but of everybody to find their place in this, because there's momentum that's happening, and I hope we don't lose it, because we cannot let our students down anymore. We cannot let our students go through our system feeling like they are uneducated about um, not only Black History Month, but enveloping Black and Indigenous people of color stories throughout our entire curriculum at every level, in every subject. Um, I um, I love tables this, that's why I'm here. It's, I moved back and um, I hope that we can continue to invest in that because that is a, that is a true investment i think and um i will keep showing up and um, i am excited to see what kind of plans we will make and what kind of results we will get um in the future and i'll stop there. thank you eliza rafina young if you want to unmute yourself, did uh, I pronounce your name correctly? No, it's Rafina. It's Greek. Rafina. Yeah, it's that simple. Okay, uh, great. Hi, um, okay, thank you. Usually I stand back and I just listen and everything else. That's what I do. Um, and I take things in, but I have to speak up. First and foremost, I'd like to apologize because I do not agree with some of the things that were being said. Um, and what I want to point out, First and foremost, I'm a woman of color. Second, I'm Jewish. Third, I was raised by a parent that was actually white. And um, I take offense to um, someone saying a white person cannot teach what it's like to be uh, a person of color. My father did a tremendous job at teaching me what it was like to carry my color. Also, I was also taught by a little old Italian nun, all about black history. She was the best. And so I take offense to that. And um, I want to apologize because I don't agree with um, the caller who had, um, excuse me, the person had, had uh, said about um, white people and not knowing what it's like. Um, I've been living in Cape Elizabeth for nearly 23 years. I'm very proud to live here. Um, the community has been just absolutely wonderful. I grew up in the greater Portland area, went to Macaulay. Um, my children went to Chevrolet. Um, and, you know, we deal with race every single day. And I am very proud that Cape Elizabeth is taking the steps forward, having teachers workshops and everything else. You know, everything takes time. We can't just rush through everything. And, um, <coughs> I am 
I am proud to, to hear what's, what's, what's going to happen, what's already happened. And I think moving forward, we just need to make sure we cross our T's and dot our I's. And um, like the other students who were talking, you know, I've experienced racism, but there's a time and place. Right now, you know, I came to this meeting because I want to hear what's going to be happening and what has been happening in our community. So um, with that said, you know, I hope to participate more um, to see what's going on and, you know, act as a resource. So thank everybody, um, the teachers, you know, Jeff Shedd, uh, Troy, and all the other teachers. Um, I sat future search um, that they had uh, a year and a half ago for, you know, our schools at district. Um, Donna, you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work, um, Kathy. So, you know, we have to start with a discussion and that's where we're at and we're making progress. So that's all we can do to, to educate ourselves about what we need to do. So please don't rush into anything. And, you know, I feel for those students and those people because, you know, like I said, I've experienced the racism, but at the same time, you know, we have to take baby steps so we don't miss anything. And that's where we're at. That's all I have to say. Thank you for that. Um, I currently don't see any other hands raised besides people who have already spoken and I'm thinking that they may not have put their hands down. Um, okay. So I'm gonna give it another second to see if anybody else wants to speak. Um, moving on, we have um, the GSEA Leadership Academy participants, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Survey. Um, Dada, who is speaking to that? Is that Liz? Is that you, Liz? Or Joanna? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Joanna Payne, and I teach eighth grade language arts. And next year, I'll also be teaching social studies. So, Thank you for this conversation um, as they move forward in that work. Um, Liz? Yarrington, I teach um, English at the high school. Um, and Joanna, sorry, I'm gonna go off script real quick. Um, I, just, I just wanted to repeat something that Halima said that I found um, chilling and important. Um, and it was, no one stood up for me. And she said, she said that for herself and she said that for her brother. Um, and I know that there are other students who've, who have said that too. And so I think um, that one line to me underscores the importance of this conversation. Um, and I hope that, you know, I hope we didn't need convincing, but if anyone on the call or in the community needed convincing, I think that should do it. Um, sorry, Joanna. Thank you. No, thanks. That's good. So uh, we're here representing seven teachers from all three schools who attended multi-district leadership training this year through the Greater Sebago Education Alliance. We're here today to share a little bit of our work and also to outline what we believe is essential work for us to move forward as an anti-racist school district. So when we started this work last August, it was clear to us um, right away in our group's first meeting that the focus of our work should be inequity and bias in our schools. We are grateful to Superintendent Wolfram and the school board for allocating funds that helped us begin this work. As a result of our work together, we created a survey to assess implicit and explicit bias in school staff. However, the school's closure due to COVID-19 prevented us from distributing that survey. Then the March 13th killing of Breonna Taylor 
the racist incident against Christian Cooper in Central Park on May 25th and the killing of George Floyd on the same day demonstrated to our group that the work we started does not match the urgency with which we feel Cape Elizabeth schools must address racism. On June 6th, our group sent a letter to district leadership outlining clear steps we believe must be taken to start our work to become an anti-racist institution. Our letter was received with support from many teachers in the district who are ready to do this work. Additionally, Superintendent Wolfram and Kathy Stankard took time to meet with us to discuss our perspective. We were also encouraged by School Board Chair Heather Altenberg's letter to the school community. We support the district taking the following actions. Professional anti-racism training for all district faculty and staff in 2020. A dedicated district budget for anti-racism training. Time, resources, and training for teachers to examine their curricula through an anti-racist lens and ongoing professional development in anti-racism. From our perspective as teachers in Cape Elizabeth, we acknowledge and believe this work will be uncomfortable. As white educators, we must lift up and listen to the voices of our black and brown students and their families. There has been a clear message from the last two protests in town that the Cape Elizabeth School District must address issues of racism. For too long, we have identified as a white school district and have failed to fully recognize students and families of color in our community. While it is true we are a majority white school district, we are fully responsible for anti-racist work. The fact that there are fewer students of color in Cape Elizabeth than in other communities does not absolve us from doing the work of anti-racism. The difficult work of deconstructing our curricula, learning about our own biases and prejudices, and how they have impacted our students in the past is vital, but cannot fall on the shoulders of individual teachers alone. Teachers must have the support of administration, school leaders, the school board and town. We need a district-wide financial commitment to this work and professional training and development. The district has a responsibility to clearly communicate with the community about the action steps it will take to address racism in our schools. And there is potential in this moment. If we don't address this now, we seem ignorant of the fact that our community is demanding change. We want to thank Superintendent, Superintendent Wolfram and the members of the school board for this workshop. Both Joanna and I are committed to this work and plan to continue to fight for these necessary changes. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, are there any questions? Gina, you still have your hand up. Is that new? Do you want to speak again? Gina Tapp? Yes, um, I was just wondering how many um, non-white teachers there are in the Cape Elizabeth School District, if you know what that number is. And I'm speaking with my, I'm an HR director for the city of Portland, so I'm, I'm wondering from a HR perspective, what is, do you have any staff that are diverse in Cape Elizabeth? I'm not aware of the number. I don't know if other administrators can speak to that. Um, I don't believe so. We have some, um, some teachers from uh, various countries. Um. Yep. Okay, so I would just suggest that that's some place that we might need to work on. And I, I work on it myself. It's a challenge for me to in my role in Portland to try to make our staff as diverse as our community. And it's really important if we're going to be serious about this, um, let's get serious about it. Yeah, we need to examine our um, recruitment um, audience. Uh, we seem to be uh, getting a lot of people that are very much the same when we recruit. So that's something that we will be looking at, um, expanding that audience and, and the area. 
I totally understand, believe me, I'm, I'm trying to do the same thing myself, but I do think it's an important part of this work is um, if we're going to say that we believe in this, then we need to get um, some people that are different than us um, in on those important roles. Agreed. Thank you for that, Dina. Yeah. Um, I'd like to invite Jana Zimmerman to speak. If you can unmute yourself, Jana, you should be able to speak up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you could not find my hands up button. I'm That's kind of, okay. Um, I had heard on an NAACP town hall that um, a woman that said, it's really not up to black people to change our culture. It is up to us. Um, and she said, if we decide that we want a, com a community that passively and complicitly um, allows inequality, any injustice, police brutality, police militarism, if that's okay with us, it's really, the black people have done all that they, and people of color, have done all they can do. They're exhausted from trying to educate us. And, you know, we've been basically, um, I'm not sure what the current term for, but, you know, not educable. So um, we've been resistant to learning. And I did want people to know that, um, let's see. Um, I did want people to know that obviously I'm a white person and um, but I came from Texas which basically still lives to a great degree that they've made changes so for example in our old neighborhood um, which had been owned by the Mexican family that lived next door there's a Latina family that lived right next door all from Mexico. They used to own the entire area, but people had moved out and white people had moved in. The schools were named, we could choose from Stonewall Jackson or Robert E. Lee for the elementary schools. You could go to Robert E. Lee Park. There were statues everywhere. The, um, when I was working as a psychologist at a state hospital, I asked, um, I sent a letter to the state, um, uh, office and ask them, help me understand how I'm supposed to choose between um, Confederate Heroes Day and Martin Luther King birthday. At the same time, they supposedly were offering Juneteenth, but it was never offered to us or that I recall. And people did not even understand why I'd even be asking. We should be lucky to get Martin Luther King birthday from their perspective. So I, I actually grew up in West Texas and it was like as if apartheid was there. And I still think that apartheid exists. If you cannot leave your home, if you cannot ride your bike, if you cannot ride your skateboard, if you cannot go bird watching in Central Park, if you cannot be at your own house putting a Black Lives Matter sign up, that's apartheid. And um, if you're not free to be as safe and as free as a white person closest to you, that's apartheid. Um, and so, and I may not have the exact definition, but I prefer to think of it that way. And Cape Elizabeth has been a wonderful place to us. Um, the Petersons clothed my child when, we see, when he came um, for years. And um, the, you know, all of our friends are very accepting when, um, uh, my son joined our family when he was four and he's a child of color. So if we had known, if I had anticipated that he was going to, to join us, we would have never moved to uh, Cape Elizabeth. The first thing I thought when we saw this place was I thought, oh my God, I have never been in such a white place. There is no diversity. There's no color this 17 years ago. Um, we waited patiently to impatiently for it to look like home. We live five minutes out of downtown Dallas um, when we moved from there. So, so it's been a wonderful place. 
but I wouldn't have moved here because my child of color, um, you know, it's a, it's a disadvantage to him, I think. Um, the, but the other thing that I think is that implicit bias is everywhere. So I'm going to tell you a story from his elementary school years. The counselor, I did not, I was not told he was in counseling. I was not told that he was being picked up for a group and it took up his lunch period. The only time this child liked at school, he was being pulled out of the lunchroom. Well, he liked PE, of course, and um, recess, but um, was lunchtime where he could chat with his friends. The counselor thought it was a good idea to ask him to invite his friends, but he was incredibly embarrassed by the whole thing. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't told that he was in there. And he actually refused one time to go and he sat with his friends and he wouldn't move. So this is the first time I learned he's getting counseling is that my child was defiant and the most defiant child she's ever seen. Now, I don't think she knew at the time that I was white, but maybe she did, maybe she didn't. But that was an incredibly implicit bias based on a very small sample of his behavior. And um, that um, I don't know that she would have done with a white child. And the fact that she was seeing my child without my knowledge or my permission, well, they got to hear about it. And I had his file destroyed, I hope. Um, I told them to. So, I don't, I think that those things happen to children of color. I think they happen to families of color. Um, and, and I think that the impression she had of my child of color was incredibly biased. You know, I don't think other children, and of course this is all speculation on my part, but looking back, there have been a number of things that have happened over the years that I think people acted with implicit bias and are intentional bias. And believe me, I've seen them both and I've engaged in both. So um, I just wanted to let you know that, that I think it does happen. I'm very embarrassed that um, the stories that I heard and I reached out to those families last night that, that I didn't take, I didn't understand it all. I didn't understand the extent of the racism, I'm very sorry. I think it's time we all stand up and speak up for these families. And um, thanks very much. And thank you, Heather. I appreciate you letting me do that. You bet. Thank you. Um, I believe Rafina has her hand raised again. Is that correct? Would you like to speak again? Yes. Um, I would just like to know, Gina, um, question for Gina. Why do you think it's important to hire a teacher of color? Um, I think that it's important for kids of color to go to a school where they see people that are like them. I think it's important that anyone that goes to work sees people like them. It's just a, something I think is important. Um, and I think if there are, if you live in a place where there are qualified people of color, then I think we can make an attempt to make them part of, of our community, to look like our community. If we live someplace where it's impossible for that to happen, I know it's very hard for that to happen, but where we are now, there are people of color all around us, many of who are very qualified, and I think we could do better at bringing them into our schools and our businesses and our, every, every organization we're in. I wanna see, I wanna see our kids look around them and see, oh, I can do that. There's somebody like me. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Understood, understand. As, as a woman of color, as who used to be a child, to me, it didn't make a, a, a difference whatsoever, whether I saw somebody like me. Um, when we took trips down to Boston, I actually grew up in Europe and came over here when I was 14. And so I saw a little bit of both. And growing up and being the only drop of color everywhere I went, it was different. But at the same time, it was just what it was. And do I feel it's important? Um, no, I don't. I just think what matters to me is whether or not that individual, you know, cares and loves and respects me. But I, I understand your point of view. I just wanted to know why you thought that. Because I'm the person that 
you're you're speaking for and i understand what you're saying i don't always agree with that and also you know when you're looking at donna to hire people she's hiring whoever's qualified you know i i and and, and to not that you're saying this but maybe there hasn't been anybody that's come through that's a person of color it was like with future search one of the things that annoyed the mess out of me at future search they kept saying we need to have more diversity in cape elizabeth me i i found a house i live here melanie is here she found a house anybody else can cross over the bridge over the border and buy a house in cape elizabeth but to sit there and say we need to have more black people or, are we going to build house and say everybody come on in you know no the, we have a choice of where we want to live. We're five miles, you know, into Portland, you know, and, but I think every, everything we're doing here is all for the good, but sometimes it scares me because, you know, there's a person who is speaking on behalf of people of color, and I'm one of those, but I don't always agree with it. And I, I appreciate it, I appreciate it immensely, but sometimes turn around and ask, you know, what do you think? And I know you have a daughter and everything else, you know, but, you know, Maine is such a unique place. You know, when the KKK came to Matt March, they, they, all the white people, I hate that word, all the, all the people, you know, who are here, they're like, get out, because this is not what, what we're, we're about. French, Native Americans, Italians, you know, Irish. And, but anyway, not to stay off subjects, but I appreciate what you're saying and I just wanted to know your point of view from it. Thank you. I would love my daughter to meet you. And I certainly, I certainly love your perspective. And I hope my daughter loves me as a white mom because I love her, <laughs> not because I'm white or black. And uh, I'd love her to meet you. I'd love to get to know you. Um, thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you. And also we do, um, um, Donna, we do have one member of staff who is kind of like, this side, Galvin, Officer Galvin. Yeah, yeah. yeah everybody forgets about him because he shaves his head. And I said, I said, Galvin, you don't tan up very well. Galvin is 100% Mexican. Um, he's the school resource officer in, um, uh, in the high school. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Great. so there is one person. <laughs> There's also um, a new softball coach that didn't coach fully. Um, this year's hire, I think um, Elizabeth can speak to it. Am I correct? She's got a daughter yeah, on the softball I, team. I, I know it feels a little uh, late to the, the conversation about staff, but um, because my daughter is a softball player, um, we were super, super excited that not only a young woman of color, but it's, it's a young woman and it's a recent softball grad. So it, I mean, we do, we have, you know, little rays of hope here and there of um, diversity and, you know, it's a recent hire. So like I said, it's, it's hope. It's a good thing. And it's a young woman of color with our young women. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, we have Margaret Brown. Bra I'm sorry, Brownlee. Margaret Brownlee up next to speak. And if you can unmute yourself, Margaret, you should be able to have the floor. Did you say my name? I said Margaret. Yeah, I did. Okay, I'm, okay I wasn't, I wasn't sure. sure. I'm multitasking at its best. Okay, so my name Great. is Margaret Brownlee. Um, <laughs> I'm not a resident of Cape Elizabeth, so let's just put that out there. I actually live in South Portland, um, but I do know Eliza and a couple of other people on the call, and I was excited to join this because I saw it on Facebook, and I love the topic. Um, I'm also facilitating a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion in education. Um, uh, a little bit about me. So I currently work at Southern Maine Community College in Career Services, where I help students find jobs and internships but I'm studying for my doctorate at UNE in educational leadership and I've worked it with elementary school kids, middle school kids, which whew, you know whoever works with middle school kids, whew, that's a lot. Um, 
high school and now college level. And so I have like this wide range of experience working in education, but I see a lot of parallels to kind of the things that you all are talking about going on in Cape Elizabeth. Um, it's also happening in South Portland um, and is also happening at the college level. Uh, prior to working at SMCC, I worked at USM and I've worked at other institutions as well. So um, I guess in the quick amount of time that I um, have to share, just a quick story. So I was born and raised here in Maine, um, left for a couple, like 11 years, came back. And, you know, Portland is different. Um, the demographics have changed quickly and it's changing all the time, which I love. There's definitely more people of color, more races, ethnicities, genders, like um, religious backgrounds. It's just really diverse and I'm, happy and proud that you all are having this conversation. I was impressed with some of the information that um, was shared with the curriculum changes. I have a background in curriculum and instruction. And so I bas basically what I'm just, I want to say is I hope what you all are doing in Cape Elizabeth is also being shared with South Portland Public Schools and the Maine Community College System and the university system because we're all struggling with the same issues. Like you're not, I don't mean to sound rude, but this is not unique. You know what I mean? This is something that's happening in every school district. And I think a lot of the resources that you've shared tonight are incredible. And um, there's still a long way to go, but you all are like in the right direction. And, um, I don't know a ton about K-12. I don't, I don't, like, I'm not a teacher, a certified teacher, but it's really nice to see because, um, you know, I just have seen the changes in, in Maine and it's just, it's really refreshing. I think, um, you know, COVID has made us like slow down and reflect on life. I've definitely slowed down and reflected a little bit more myself being home and, um, working from home and it's just, it's really nice to see. So that's it. Thank you for joining us and for speaking up. Uh, Audra Gore, if you wanna unmute yourself, you've got the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping we were talking about that there's a lot of hard work and uncomfortable work ahead of us and I think an aspect that I'm hoping to see um, that is going to be some growing pains for the school and the community is finding a better way of communicating together. And in certain aspects, when I'm saying raising our kids, I, I mean, we're the parents, but they go to school during the day. So there's this, this joint aspect. And some of what's happening at school is known by teachers and it's yet it's not communicated to parents and um, that's happened in lots of different bullying scenarios where I didn't find out that my son had even gone to the principal until a year later. So there, there's this communication piece that I'm hoping can be a part of this because this is not just a school issue, it's a community issue and it shouldn't, I don't want it to be about punishment, but it needs to be about support. And if my child is making overtly racist comments, I as a parent want to be able to help parent him through that and know that and grow and learn together. So I, I'm hoping that part of this hard work we're gonna do is finding a way to, to not be the school and parents that this, this has to be together. So I'm hoping that can be the hard work too. Thank you for that point and perspective. Um, Melanie Thomas again, your hand is raised. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I just wanted to touch bases one more time. I was not going to speak again. 
um, but uh, Rafina had uh, brought up some things um, and I, I happen to disagree. I, I think we a thousand percent need um, to go seek out some professionals that are just as qualified to teach at Cape Elizabeth um, and find them the same way we recruit um, anybody else, um, put some effort into um, stealing them or finding them from other states um, and, and open that up um, immediately. Um, I am here, I, I cannot afford a house here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I am here on subsidized housing um, and I'm a single mom, a disabled mom. So I, I, I wanna make that known because um, we would not be here if it wasn't for affordable housing. Um, and uh, my kids and I were amazing. My, my kids are smart, uh, we belong here, but we happen to be here for uh, reasons that are different than many others. Um, so I just wanted to be open and honest and transparent about um, that. Um, I, I also think uh, you, you need to get mm -hmm. more um, bias training and that from people of color. I, again, I think um, early on at Pond Cove needs um, immediate action to address some issues and some understanding with kids. My daughter has had two issues, um, one in kindergarten and one in second grade. Um, a, child, a child that did not want to play with her uh, at recess because of her color. And then a outspoken child, a boy who uh, in the lunch line was talking about slavery and how my daughter wouldn't even be able to have any rights. Um, and, you know, do I know how that has impact, impacted her right now? No, I don't. Was that handled well? I believe so. Um, but will it affect her? Probably, yes. Um, and, and that needs to change. So I, I want more for her so that she has more of an opportunity later. She needs to see more color here, more diversity, and that could start immediately and that could start with the school. So I, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Uh, Halima has raised her hand again. Are you there, Halima? Hi, yes. like to... okay. sorry. I am That's on okay. the phone with Khadija. Her okay. phone died and she would like to say some stuff. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Khadija, you you wanna speak now? Okay, one second, please. Okay. All right. Hello? All right, okay, so I am meeting myself. I'm Khadija, so you can speak. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Go ahead, we're listening. Yes, hi. Thank you for having me again. Um, yes. My first phone died, so I'm driving and reaching for my second phone. I wanted to mention something. I want to address um, the other lady who spoke before. She said something about um, a, a, a white nun who was able to teach African-American history to her and the fact that her dad, who's white, taught her how to be black. That's one good let in the sea, in the ocean. That cannot be what we trying to accomplish or what we gonna talk about. She got privilege for having that that who stood up for her. Privilege comes in many form and shape. It's because I'm pretty, I'm privileged because I'm tall, I'm privileged because I got an education. And if I can't acknowledge those privileges that I have, then I'll be going against my own people. When I see another African woman, I have to acknowledge that I was able to get further than her in life because of my privilege. So privilege is not just being white. In America, yes, being white takes you places. And everywhere else comes with form and shape. 
I really want to point out and insist on the fact that I feel if we're going to be teaching at school, we should get African-American teacher to teach African-American history. If we're going to teach Islam, we need to get a Muslim to teach Islam. If we're going to teach about anything else, the people who are concerned, the people who are in charge of it should be the people who experience that. It can't be... Doctors are the ones who teach medicine. I mean, come on. You don't go to school. You don't go to school and try to learn how to be a doctor. And then your economic teacher come and like, okay, if we cut here and there, it will be four plus two. It doesn't work like that. Anyway, thank you again for listening. Yes, thank you. And I, I just want to point out and remind everyone that we all have our own opinions. Um, we're here to respect opinions, listen to one another. Um, and um, I really appreciate listening to everybody. Um, so just a reminder that we all want to be respecting what other people are saying. Um, and I, and in, in that is hearing opposite sides at times. Um, and I am hearing a little bit of that. So um, I don't see other hands being raised. So I'll just take one more moment to see if anybody else would like to speak. Okay. So next on the agenda is ideas for moving forward. Um, and this is a discussion portion of the agenda. Um, I'm gonna make a suggestion that I feel like there were a lot of things brought up tonight. There was a lot of conversation, a lot of fantastic ideas. Um, I would like to, and I'm open to discussion with Donna and uh, school boards who are here to uh, maybe go through and compile those suggestions and maybe share that document somehow. Um, I'm, I'm partly recognizing I don't want to um, I don't want to take away from the conversation. I think this is a very rich and important conversation, but after two hours, I, I start to get fuzzy. Like I can only, I can only do so much. And I think there's others that are like that. So I also want to respect people's time. I feel like right now is not the best time to start with ideas moving forward um, and having a discussion on that. Um, I, I think either we set up another time to meet and have that discussion um, or we work to compile it. And I'm seeing some school board members raise their hands. So I'm gonna call on Phil to start with. Um, I'd love your input on this. Yeah, thank you, Heather. And I don't sort of speak twice. I, ju I just wanna quickly, um, one suggestion um, and mm -hmm. uh, based on your, your question and then just, but one comment first, because I just wanted to acknowledge, um, and I think we didn't do that yet, the teachers, um, uh, Joanna and Liz's presentation. I read the I read the letter. I, I try as a school member not to engage on email in a substantive way, so I waited to the public meeting. But I thought it, it was a very thoughtful letter, and I appreciated all five of your suggestions. I think we should all work towards them. I will commit myself to working towards them as a school board member in the way that's appropriate. And some and some of those things I think are for the administration to work on. But I will view my work through that lens and through the lens of what I've heard tonight from members of the community. So I just want to make that comment and to acknowledge that. And my son's teacher was one of the signatories too, and I, that was uh, heartwarming to see. Um, my suggestion, um, Heather, because I agree with you, um, I think I'd like to sort of see a compilation of what we've heard and digest it. But my, my one suggestion, I, a chair of my own department that runs meetings, and what I try to do is if you don't put on agendas every single time, you forget about it. And I'd like to have this topic be a recurring item for a while um, and, and not a special meeting or another workshop. And, and maybe it's the workshop top topic for our, our, you know, our monthly workshop, but to not let it drop off 
um, and to force us to continue to come back and revisit um, revisit this this conversation um, going forward. So that's just my one suggestion on on that. But I agree with you. At this point, I'd like to see a compilation of me and revisit at the next meeting. Thank you. Um, I see that Hope has her hand up. I can't hear you yet. You're unmuted, but try it again, Hope. I can't. <laughs> um, ask to unmute. Try it again. Can you speak? I don't know why you're not coming through. Okay. Um, is it something, Hope, perhaps that you could type into the chat box or is it too long? <laughs> now they're just clapping in the hands. <laughs> I'm not sure. No, I still can't hear you. Do you want to try calling me on my cell? No. Oh, who do I hear? Not you. Never mind. Okay. Um, shows that you're not muted. I wonder if you pop off the call and try to come back in and I can readmit you. Thank you for everybody's patience for a moment. I would like to see what Hope would like to contribute. Um, in the meantime, check out the chat. There is a lot being communicated. She's probably muted by our hardware. Okay, she's trying to come in. Thank you, Mimi. She's back. She's connecting to audio. Dun, 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 dun. Hope? Hello? There she is. Yay. <laughs> I'm using my computer now. Now I forgot what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> you can't. So I just re reiterate everything that Phil said. I am so appreciative of the teachers making Joanna and Elizabeth, your presentation is excellent. Um, uh, and all the, the information about what we're doing is excellent. Um, I want to thank um, the, the participant Khadija for being so frank, and I'd love to know what that creepy smile looks like. Um, and I think that really kind of talks to um, one of the things I don't think that's on our to-do list, which is getting that this frank feedback. Like this is something, we haven't had this frank conversation and we can talk a lot about curriculum and we can pat ourselves on the back as like good white people and give ourselves gold stars. But until we ask the people of color in the district, how is it going? Like, we don't know, you know? So I think one of the things I'd, I'd, I'd wanna see on our to-do list is getting that pulse, like over time, how, what is the experience like for those people? Because until we get that feedback, you know, the best boss I ever had always said to me, how am I doing? How am I doing? How can I do better? How, we have to ask those people, how are we doing? Um, and that's it. Thank you for waiting for, for my technical problems to resolve. Yeah, thank you, Hope. Uh, Elizabeth, you have your hand raised again. I wanted to um, agree with your suggestion that we compile the suggestions made and um, find another time because not only is my computer dying, but my brain is too. And um, I also wanted to, I, I feel like we're echoing and echoing, but I, 
Um, I'm so thankful to the teachers for the work that was done in the presentation. I too carefully read those emails and I was really excited to know that you're going to present tonight. Um, I'm thankful that everybody that was willing to speak spoke tonight, even, even if it was hard. It, it was certainly, you know, I, I'm sure it's hard that people have to tell their stories over and over again. And it's hard to hear. It, it hurts my heart. So thank you for everybody for participating. And um, I also wanted to um, kind of single out Odd for Gore because I believe that this is a partnership. Um, I was a teacher, I am a school board member, and I'm a mother. And so we have to do this together. You know, children aren't born thinking and saying these things that might be very hurtful. They may learn them at home, they may learn them at school, but you know, it's a partnership. So I appreciate that you made that point that we're in this together. We need to do this work together. So thank you. Thank you. I'm just, um, I'm just for Responding to everyone, Audrey Gore was wondering what the email was that Phil that asked, that they had compiled an email with um, asks steps that you would like to see the district take, um, and that email was sent to the superintendent and myself. Um, and other, just not myself, I'm sorry, this is the late night coming in. And the other, uh, that is what the email is, that's the email that's being referred to. So it wasn't a public, but it, it, it wasn't out to the community. It was asking us to um, follow through with certain steps forward. And that's what was just, Um, I'm reading. Um, Donna, how do we answer that one? I, um, I think we could maybe, my, my computer is freezing a bit here. Yeah. I don't know if people can hear I can't me. Hear, I can't hear what you're saying really. You can. Yeah, you my computer is starting. I think, to get Naz, I think Naz, Heather Nazar wants to talk. Heather, can you not see me? Nazar, why, okay. why don't you go? I can ahead. now, Nazar. Uh, I've been raising my hand with, on the camera and I've been raising hand virtually, and I thought there was going to be something going on here technically. So uh, uh, I have multiple hats to wear. I'm and, sorry about that, Nasser. Uh, well, I have multiple hats to wear. And uh, one is, of course, being a school board. One is being on the Cape Diversity Coalition. And one is being a parent of my two daughters who spoke eloquently and my sister. And those are the people I have to deal with at the dinner table, at movies, and a car ride at sports, and they're constantly, constantly educating me, constantly, and constantly reminding me, what have you done while you were on the school board? So I guess I'm gonna speak as a parent first, and then at the end I'm gonna speak as a, as a school, board member, school board member. So indeed, uh, I joined the school board because of Halima and Hamza. Uh, and uh, I spoke yesterday in a workshop and it was an emotional speech, and I'm not gonna give the emotional talk over here. I gotta be stronger. And uh, so, just a short story. Change in Cape Elizabeth takes time. I agree with Rafina in reference to that. Change takes time. I agree with Rafina uh, because she's, I don't think she has a lot of white hair. She's not my age, but I pretend that I'm her age. <laughs> that we, we, we went through a lot of hardship and our hearts were stronger against uh, racism. I tell that day and night, day and night to my kids, they're not gonna believe that. Dad, that was your time. Boomer, that was your time. This is our time. We want change now, we want change yesterday. 
So those are the energy these kids have. And I applaud that. Uh, I'm not going to stop them from that. Uh, not Rufina's kids, not my kids, not Melody's kids. So this is what the diversity is all about, guys. Having a different opinion. We at the Cape Diversity Coalition have been existing since the last four years. And we still struggle to this day to come with a common vision or single vision or single voice because we are represent uh, Judaism, we represent religions, we represent continents, we represent cultures, we represent personal opinions and so forth. So Benedict here has been lucky or privileged or that grew up with wonderful parents, wonderful parents. And we have, uh, I'm sorry, that was, um, I meant Rafina. And Melanie, maybe possibly an African American. Khatija is immigrant African American. I'm an immigrant uh, uh, Afghan from Afghanistan. And my kids are American, but they wear hijab. They're Muslim. They're target for that reason. So it's great to have opinions. And it's great to have this conversation, as Hope said and others have said. This forum, no matter we, when I joined the school board, we just had a staff and, 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 and my family had a conversation. But if these forums are more available on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, the conversation like this would rise. No one knows what's going on in the locker rooms. No one is going wrong or knows that what conversation or joke takes place with my kids or others. No one knows when to stand up for other people. Uh, so I do have a lot of uh, comments, but uh, they just would like to end with the fact of uh, the fact that what change have I brought? Now, what the reason I didn't want to face bring out my face up here because I felt quote unquote shame for the people who are here, especially the color people, that I haven't done enough. And to, to tell you the truth, I haven't done enough. The simple thing that I've wanted. A simple thing that Heather knows, that Mr. Shed knows, and Donna knows, and Mr. Shed has actually said to me, when is Ramadan coming up so we can put it on the calendar? I always discussed it in an email, we discussed it publicly, and actually Mr. Shed, I was exhilarated. I'm not the type of person, I have to mention things once, I don't push things. That's my personality. I don't push. I mention it once, and then I leave it to you guys to be educated as the one person said. Last time, my whole conversation was about all my life, I've been educating people around me, all my life for while well, being here in this country for 33 years or so. So to have that, when is Ramadan celebrated? When is the Eid celebrated? Does make a big difference for my kids, being a Muslim, being a hijabi, it makes a big difference. But imagine if that calendar is in the parents' hands, they say, oh, what's the Ramadan? What the hell is Ramadan? Or well, imagine a kid inquiring another kid, where's Ramadan apart? This is how you learn. This is how you interact. This is how you open conversations. So yes, it's a minor thing. It's a small thing. But it, it has a lot of positive aspects. So indeed, as a school board member, we have worked on the curriculums. We have done a great job. We have wonderful staff. We have a great staff. And uh, John's Holtridge position uh, is awesome, awesome. He's taking kids to Wainfleet. He's taking kids around. He's inviting people. Great, great curriculum. And so it does not just end with the curriculum. It just not. It's the daily activity. How do we correct the locker rooms? How do we correct conversation in the fields, the sports fields? How do we correct the conversation that the parents are having at the sports? How do we correct that people yelling at racial slurs at sports games, which has happened? And uh, those are the things that the book does not teach you. Those are the things that a training might teach you. Those are the things you learn from your students. Some of his, I think Hope said, somebody said here, let's bring our students, those who have been harassed, let's have that conversation with them. Uh, so, uh, it is a great school system. We are all here for education. Unfortunately, education for all of us is number one priority, and we are willing to 
take racism. We're willing to be bullied. We're willing to be isolated. We're willing to be the sole person because the education here is great. As my daughter Halima said, let's take a step further and make it more welcoming for everybody. So I do not know which hat I wore, but I think I wore multiple hats. And uh, I was, I'm proud to be on the board. And, uh, uh, and I actually want to applaud uh, the HR from the city of Portland for hiring the best two people, and that's me and my sister. So yes, it does, <laughs> diversity does make a difference. Yes, diversity does bring a change. Whether you like it or not, a different opinion is always welcome. Everybody here had a great idea. Yesterday, yesterday was a lot of people were, uh, in the yesterday workshop, a lot of people had a common idea. This one person said that, what about the other side? The system is great, no change needs to be made, be made in this minor. But I even welcome that person's opinion, and I welcome everybody's opinion here. Without the diversity, we're not gonna grow. And the reason the diversity does exist is to have a challenge conversation like this tonight. So I applaud everybody for dedicating their time tonight and for listening. But I really hope that we can continue to have this dialogue in the future on a regular basis, especially with students. And that is one of the goals of the Keep Diversity as well. So if you want to include those people, that organization, by all means, welcome them too. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nasser. Uh, and my apologies, I did not see your hand raised. Um, I apologize. Um, I am looking, Phil's hand is still up, but my thinking is that it just didn't go back down. Um, and that looks like that's all the comments. I'm gonna end by saying this is to be continued. It feels like there is complete consensus, though varying opinions perhaps. There is definitely the desire, it sounds like, to move forward with making this a regular part of the conversation. Um, without a doubt. And um, we're gonna try to make that happen. Uh, so we'll put together some potential future steps. We'll have more conversation. We'll announce it. We'll let people know. Um, I too found this forum quite um, beneficial. Um, as Elizabeth had mentioned, my heart aches for some of the stories that I heard, but I, feel very grateful that I was able to be a part of the conversation and hear those stories. Um, I am just very grateful for everyone. At one point we had up to 45 people here, I think. Um, so that's also a testament to say that this is important to a lot of people. Um, and if we don't have the remembrance of the connection of humanity, that we are, um, nothing else really matters. Like that really has to be at the heart, um, caring about one another in this way. So um, with that, I'll say good night. Thank you again for being here. Please stay in the conversation with us um, and continue to check in and um, share your thoughts. Um, I know that my email box is always open my phone is always open um, if you ever want to talk or share. Um, so I will do my best to sort of take your information and um, or your thoughts and your ideas and incorporate it. So, all right. Thank you again. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Thank you, everybody.